Maria. Welcome back to Dad Bod History. Uh, tonight we've got a special Dad Bod Goes to the Movies episode for you. I'm Eric. I'm Jake. I'm Cameron. Welcome, welcome. How are we doing tonight? Good. Actually, before we get into this movie, Bree and I had this realization. Bree's my wife. Um, how that was you the realization. All know who, yeah, I figured it out, guys. She's my <laughs> wife. Um, you all know who Sisyphus is? Yeah, the rock rolling guy. The rock rolling guy, exactly. Good job, Cameron. Um, so the story of Sisyphus is he was a, a Greek king, king of Corinth, and he was a tyrant king. And when he died, his punishment for being so cruel in life was that he had to roll a boulder up a hill perpetually. And whenever he would get close to the top, it would roll back down. So the realization that my wife and I had is that is an allegory from the ancient Greeks to us as parents in that no matter what you do, no matter how many dishes you wash or clothes you clean or floors you sweep, it's going to be the next moment you turn around, it's going to be instantly dirty again. Um, and so that's the, that's the lesson from the ancients I have for you today. Um, it literally happened about five minutes before I logged into this, me and my wife were talking and we were like, it just never ends. And I'm like, it's just like Sisyphus. So it's kind of also like there you go. Dante's Inferno and in that you're always having your eyes picked out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like that's going to be more like me as a dad when my kids are teenagers. <laughs> my eyes are going to constantly being picked out. But right now, it's just a, a never ending struggle. Yeah, we got to the point. We got to the point over the weekend where our house was so clean that the kids literally said, this is really nice. We should do this more. Yeah, and, yeah, we and, should. Yeah, totally. If you if you kids would help out, we, we could. Yeah. Exactly. So, anyway, I, I think if we need to start digging into the Greek um, stories and fables more okay. and see if they're just actually real-life applications for parenthood, because you know, I, I bet they are. I, I did tell my students last week... <laughs> and the week before, and probably even the week before that, that, um, you know, 2020 is pretty bad, but the truth is there's nothing new under the sun, and everything we're dealing with this year has been dealt with in greater conflagrations, I suppose, um, throughout history, and uh, we, we really just have to look back and read. We have all that wisdom there, whether it's, you know, parenting is like pushing a boulder up a hill, or, mm-hmm. you know, we've seen worse plagues. We've seen worse uh, political um, extremism and, and all this stuff. None of it is new. Uh, it's just we haven't experienced it, and most of us just haven't read enough history. So, Yeah, that's very hey, true. Historical knowledge helps you with parenting, helps you with homework. I mean, what, what does it not do? What can't it do? Yeah. I agree. Pay the bills. Heck, even the guy. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Nobody goes into history for the money. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, speaking of paying the bills, sp- paying the bills. Well, and, and taking something that's not new under the sun, but putting a new twist on it. What uh, what movie are we were talking about today? So we watched Hamilton. And oh, yeah. um. Hamilton is a musical, um, recently released on Disney Plus over this summer. Um, if you hadn't been able to watch it in, you know, a live production, you probably weren't able to see it except for YouTube clips and, and listening to the music, neither of which I had done. Um, even after many, many people bringing it to me and saying, you have to watch this and kind of taking a page out of Jake's book. When someone comes to me saying you have to watch this thing, I was like, eh, I don't have to. So That's the opposite. I'm, I'm not going to. <laughs> mm-hmm. And seeing something be popular, I was just like, no, I don't want to jump on the train just because it's popular. 
So um, Hamilton, the musical, tells the story of Alexander Hamilton, um, one of our founding fathers, um, through his life, you know, starting with him as, you know, an orphan bastard child living on the island of Nevis in the Caribbean, witnessing not just slavery, but like the worst extremes of slavery during that time. Um, coming to New York, writing his way off the island, uh, coming to New York and going to Princeton, meeting a whole slew of characters, um, not characters, but I mean real people, right? Aaron Burr, uh, Hercules Mulligan, John Lawrence, the Marquis de Lafayette, George Washington, um, into even James Madison, James Monroe, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, all these people that we see as these integral parts of our founding of our nation, uh, you know, and he fights in the war as George Washington's aide de camp. Uh, afterwards, he's a lawyer, and then he's part of the um, Constitutional Convention. Um, he writes the Federalist Papers. He's the first Treasury uh, Secretary of the Treasury, which he puts us on the road basically to financial. I suppose freedom would be the word, even though if you look at what he did, it was. I think Something solvency that, is probably a yeah, better word. Yeah, I mean, word. it made it so that we could be a nation and not just fall apart. And then, of course, he dies fairly young at the age of 49 um, at the end of a pistol fired by Aaron mm-hmm. Burr. So, And it goes on into even what happens with his wife, Eliza, who lives 50 years longer and, and her contributions. So it's this kind of like big story um, about this individual man who, I'll be honest— up until the point that I started watching that musical, uh, I knew very little about him. Other than he was probably a Hamiltonian, he was a Federalist, and he was uh, Treasury Secretary. He started the first National Bank. And outside of that, I was kind of, he had been at the edge of my radar as far as a founding father. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, like, I, I was totally caught unaware about his military career. I mean, he was highly decorated as a military man too. And that was something that was totally new to me. Yeah. And I guess that's the one really cool thing about um, a biopic like this is that there's so much more than, and I hate kind of falling into this trope, but what you're taught in, in history class or what you're taught in school, right? Um, you know, and, and so you get to see shades of this man's life that you otherwise wouldn't have seen or wouldn't have known, um, had Min, was it Lynn manuel Miranda created this musical? And, and so I think that's a really cool thing is that it kind of opens up this whole world, um, on one specific founding father that most of America doesn't know much about other than he's the guy on the 10. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a, a great thing to, yeah, to kind of have. It's, um, you know, having this kind of thing. So my, my own experience is that when I started watching this musical, uh, my family was watching The Greatest Showman. And I'm just like, I, I've seen it, right? So I pulled up my phone. I said, I haven't watched Hamilton yet. Let me just start. Let me see. I got like two songs in and I was hooked. And then... Then I kept watching it that night, and then I had to stop about 45 minutes in saying, A, if I watch this without my wife, she'll be mad at me, and B, I don't know anything about Hamilton, because I'm watching this opening stuff. I'm like, I didn't realize he fought in the war. I didn't realize he was an immigrant. I didn't realize a lot of these little details that, to me, are important, so that's when I stopped, and I picked up the biography by Ron Chernow, on which the musical is inspired by. Um and started yeah. reading that. And a lot of what the musical pulls out in terms of kind of that personality and, and the very personal parts really comes from that biography. Because that biography is, Ron Chernow is, is kind of a master at bringing out the, the life of these otherwise, like he's on a $10 bill, he's got a marble bust, he's this mm-hmm. figure, and he's just a, a, a collection of these important actions but he was also a human, an individual, and had this very interesting life. Yeah, I I, I agree with that, and I think um, it's it's just kind of cool to see that 
development. Although I will say, and I was talking to my wife about it because we watched it together today, and I felt like, I mean, it was a two hour and 40 minute show, um, but I feel like, man, they, it's like they sped read through some of the stuff to, to kind of literally like there's it's one of like the there's, fastest musicals in terms of numbers of words per minute. Yeah. Or was it? Yeah. Is that like a real stat or is yeah, that just... no, like I guess if, <laughs> if you take the, the words, the number of words that they're speaking per minute and you uh-huh. stretch it out over the tempo of a normal musical, it would be like six hours long. Okay. Because you've got some like Angelica Schuyler's, um, actress and uh david riggs who plays thomas jefferson and uh marquis de lafayette, lafayette. they have some ex- yeah. the, the number of words per minute in some of their songs they're saying like 30 words in three seconds i mean it's just really fast okay but yeah there, there's a lot of things that i guess were and we can kind of get into the historicity historiosity of some of this you know alexander hamilton did not meet Aaron Burr, John Lawrence, uh, Hercules Mulligan, and Lafayette all in the same night at the same bar, right? Like these relationships mm-hmm. were developed over months, even years, um, upon him arriving in New York City. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, a lot of things are kind of, they have to be. It's, it's this, the book is over 800 pages long, so, and the man's life was 49 years. So to kind of put these events into, you know, you always do this with, art right we we condense certain things to get the story moving yeah that's why they use so much rap music too because it's faster right because i always <laughs> saw in I, my they mind they were going to do opera but they're like this isn't quick enough <laughs> exactly and i always knew that the founding fathers were big rappers i just didn't know that much so yeah right that, I, that was a big takeaway this this it's really actually one of the more accurate things about the musicals the, the rap battles between Jefferson and Hamilton. They really was, shed yeah. light on that. Yeah. Un, you know, unsung hero of the revolution, which was rap. <laughs> and and yeah. here I am thinking that the 1990s was the golden era of rap. I mean, yeah. silly me. Silly you. Silly yeah. you. So, so I guess, I, I guess I had a few observations in general watching the movie or it's not a movie. It's a musical. Um, and one that kept popping up was don't throw away your shot. Yeah. And that one is especially telling because of how Hamilton died. Spoiler alert, he got shot. So um, I think that, but that theme kept popping up and it didn't just pop up in a, in a martial sense. It popped up in everything about Hamilton's life, at least in the way this musical described was he's not going to throw away his chance to have a legacy. Everything was driving towards this legacy. You know, he came from an immigrant. He was the a bastard. He was the son of a whore, as they kept referring to. Um, and he didn't want that to be his legacy. You know, so he found a way to New York and, and he wanted to join a war because that's how you move up in the world is by being part of a war. And then he became a lawyer and he took all these cases on and then he forced his way into into the war effort and into Washington's administration and everything he did was drive, 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 drive. And don't leave any opportunity to make a name for yourself out on the table, I guess. And I thought that was a big theme um, that I saw throughout that kind of dominated his story. And counter to that, Aaron Burr, the way he was depicted was the man who will just wait and he will wait for his opportunity and he will wait for his chance. And so you have Hamilton on this one end who's driving, driving, driving and Aaron Burr saying, no, I'll prudent. Prudence is the word that kept popping in my mind whenever Aaron Burr was on the stage was he was more, he was just more prudent. He was slower and he was slower to act. And then the one time he did act that led to the big conflict conflict between him and Hamilton. Yeah. That's funny you say that because as I was watching it with April today also, it was the first time I, I sat through it and watched the whole thing, is um, we compared him to Washington. And, you know, typically you think of that really strong leader as, you know, punch through that wall, really intense, really, you know, what you're describing, Jake. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he didn't really reach that 
pinnacle. I mean, he did a lot of things, but he didn't become a president. He didn't, you know, quite, I guess, get there. And, and that yeah. was probably because of the early death. It was probably because uh, he had a little bit of a chip on his shoulder. So mm. kind of ironic that, yeah, his, his greatest asset and, and, and weakness as well. Oh, yeah. totally. You know, Jake, you mentioned ahead, the, you know, he's not going to throw away his shot. And, I, and again, I saw that theme through again, kind of contrasted with Aaron Burr. And, and that's probably one of my favorite numbers in the musical is uh, wait for it. Uh, Aaron Burr's solo early on kind of there, there's something in there that resonates with me in terms of I sometimes see people excelling past me or getting to something before I've gotten there uh, before my age of mid 30s mid to late 30s right and and kind of being like well maybe my opportunity has not arrived right uh maybe this podcast is my opportunity who knows but Mm -hmm. uh you know hamilton he says you know not throwing away my shot not throwing away my shot and then of course in his last scene he chooses to throw away his shot right he he's yeah he's and he directs his son to throw away his shot literally like it's ironic in that the one time he doesn't take his shot, it ends up in his demise. Yeah. And it was, you know, it's curious because as I, I guess I'm going to kind of bring some of the stuff from the book in, honor is something that keeps coming up in terms of Hamilton's personal feelings. Everything, if his honor is, is, you know, tarnished, he has to do something about his his uh, reputation. Um, and so he always has to defend it. What's interesting is he has a lot to say about duels, but he was only really involved in the one duel. I, I think, well, he mm-hmm. was he was involved in the other duel as a second, right? And outside of his son's duel and then his own, you know, he talked a lot. He had a lot of challenges to duels, but they always kind of resolved uh just current events i'd be down for a duel to watch a a duel in some of our politics (laughs) right now just be easier on all of us Uh but you know i digress so i you know we kind of talked maybe we didn't get your first everyone's first impressions um i'll say like i said it got me hooked the music is very catchy but not in a not in a cheap way. Um, it it kind of hangs on in my head, and that's because it's it's kind of there's so much going on too. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of the first impressions, Eric, I was bound and determined to have a bad attitude about it when I sat down. You know, my wife was was watching it, um, you know, kind of chipping away at it all week, and I was making fun of it, and I didn't watch it from the beginning, and I saw a little five minute clips mm-hmm. and everything. Um, but to your point, first five minutes, a couple songs in, I was really, really hooked on it. It was really good. Um, a lot of one liners that were super memorable in the in the mm-hmm. songs that are just aside from, you know, the the story itself, it was really poignantly said. Um, and I wish I would have written them down, but very, very good song, very well written. So I, I had to eat my words about half an hour in, begrudgingly. <laughs> yeah. Um, another theme I saw was you never know who lives and dies to tell your story. Mm-hmm. And that was one that kept getting brought up. And I thought that was really interesting in that the Hamilton, the way they depict him is... They keep he wants this legacy and he wants this legacy. And it's like, yeah, but once you die, no you have no control yeah. over what people say about you. And Aaron Burr towards the end confesses, he goes, I am now the villain of your history. Yeah. Saying the way you speak of me is as as this villain. And then it shows that at least the way this musical portrays it, it's a lot more nuanced than that, you know. And I think it's just a good uh it's yeah. just a good reminder I'd say in, Aaron, as a person is like, we want this legacy, but you can't control what people are going to think about you. You can't control what they're going to say about you. Yeah, it, It's interesting because Aaron Burr comes off almost like 
almost as a character that I'm I'm sympathetic for at the end. You know, mm-hmm. seeing that as he's he's realizing he's the villain. But of course, a lot of that is is kind of the the musical writer's kind of take on Aaron Burr. It it pretty much seems that Aaron Burr following that incident really was almost just had no qualms about it. it was just like whatever that's done um but it did ruin his reputation and ruin his opportunities after that um and yeah when you talk about who's going to tell the story <clears throat> you have george washington and thomas jefferson and john adams these guys live for quite a long time after and and they were all older to begin with but they live longer into their lives than than hamilton did um, and so they had some control over who was going to be taking care of their papers. They had time to prepare that and, and that. But Hamilton's wife, Eliza, basically takes it upon herself to find out the story of her husband. And she has a ton of time to do it. And it's it's kind of amazing to think she has that line at the very end where she says, you know, I sat down and talked with every soldier that ever served with you. And I'm trying to think about that's that is not a simple thing to do today right if somebody died in afghanistan and their spouse tried to speak to everyone who served with that person that would that would take months to arrange not Mm -hmm. not to mention actually do and she does this with all these soldiers to figure out what he was really about and to get all the stories about him that was kind of a uh, I don't know, I want to say kind of a tough moment to think through what that took for her. Yeah, especially since without her, essentially single-handedly restoring his legacy, I mean, Hamilton probably goes down in history a lot more like Aaron Burr in that, mm-hmm. yeah, he was a founding father, but he probably doesn't make it on the 10, no. you know, like, no, if Jefferson and Adams have their way with, with their telling of, of Hamilton, it, he comes across mm-hmm. as a terrible person. Not to mention like every effort he made damaged the union as well. Um, mm-hmm. Because neither of them at the end really liked him at all. Yeah. And I'd say one of the things I've noticed about Hamilton, again, I'm doing a lot of reading about him. I'm trying to think of like who are the people in history who cannot stop to the point that they will just keep talking and or writing they don't they don't recognize that other people are hurting or that it's damaging other people they're just like no I have to go this is the right thing nothing I'm saying is wrong and the first person that comes to mind is Martin Luther like he just didn't mm-hmm. he didn't give a crap about what he wrote about somebody else. He's like, but it's true, so I'm going to write it. And I was kind of like Hamilton. I'm not going to hold anything back because the consequences of my writing don't matter to me in terms of how it hurts other people or how it affects other people. And I kind of I saw that theme coming up and up again and that he didn't hold back ever. I think it was interesting, and they mentioned this as a theme a lot in the songs is, the fact that he was maniacal about his writing. He, what did they say? He wrote like he was running out of time. Yeah. And I think yeah. he knew that that was probably his greatest legacy, is defending the Constitution and writing all of those articles and all those papers about, no, we should stick with this document because it's got a lot of potential. And you know, here we are all these years later. Um, but all of the things that he did, all the things that he accomplished, that probably... And, 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 good for him for having that foresight to say, you know, this is how I can dictate my own legacy as best as possible. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, that was a really cool theme for me because, yeah, he took that matter into his own hands. He didn't try to rely on anybody to do that. Yeah, and I think it's, it's interesting because in this musical they balanced that drive of his and that I don't care attitude that he have with Eliza who is like why can't I be enough for you 
and others in the musical saying, you're never satisfied, like nothing is good enough for you. Um, it didn't matter to him kind of how much he had attained or what he had. It was never going to be enough for him, at least the way they presented, is that it really wasn't about getting, it wasn't about having these things. It wasn't about having a family. It wasn't necessarily about having succeeded in the war. It was always the next battle or the next debate or the next position for him, the way they portrayed it. And so that trait of his that made him so successful was also the trait that led him to have an affair on his wife because he wouldn't go with his family upstate for the summer because he had to get this bill passed for the First National Bank. He had to. That was his drive. Um, and so he sacrificed his family for this other goal. And, and in doing that, he had the affair with uh, Maria Reynolds. So um, it's another instance where they kind of show this double-edged knife where his eloquence and his drive did so many great things, but then those very same words and that very same drive led to a huge rift in his own family. And that's why it makes makes it so fascinating is mm -hmm. how many other stories can you think of where this really great man in a lot of ways just has terrible, terrible flaws. And I think we're all attracted to that because we all have our flaws or, or whatever, and his happened to be greater than most. Not um, Eric, according to Eric. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. It, Eric is uh, immune to that. Um, yeah, and it might seem like it's out of left field, but um, I'll bring it up anyway. My wife and I were sitting around talking the other day. Um, we were comparing King Solomon from the Bible and King David from the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I asked her, I said, what... You know, obviously both of them had some pretty fatal flaws and did some really foolish things. And um, they both did some really great things. And history remembers them probably positively at the end of the day. Um, but it, it, it's cool to see that dichotomy. Everybody has that um, attraction, I think, to people that have that dichotomy because they're, they're fascinating. Um, I remember watching the Lance Armstrong, um, uh, what do you call it, biopic, I guess, of his life, and it was really, really fascinating. I mean, he's an unbelievable athlete, unbelievable competitor, but man, that guy was a jerk, you know, mm -hmm. to a lot of people, and he doesn't back down from anything that he ever said, doesn't apologize, so again... I, I saw, as I was watching it, I thought about a lot of other historical figures. Yeah, I guess that would be yeah. kind of like uh, The Last Dance with Michael Jordan in that, you, yeah. know, he's, he, you know, he was the way he was to his teammates. And when he was kind of, that was brought up to him, he's just like, but our goal was to win. Like, that, that was the job we had in front of us. And if somebody wasn't on board or wasn't cutting it, then they needed to be told that. Like, I, and he, it just, it seems like it doesn't even cross his mind that people were hurt by it or that he was being a jerk. He was doing his job to the best of his ability. Mm -hmm. And it just wasn't even a question. Right. And uh, as far as David being remembered in history, my friend Uriah is telling me he has something different to say. <laughs> okay. He was uh, no, you had a, a your friend Uriah? Uriah. Yeah, you but best buds with him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and I guess kind of digging into that though, I think what you said when you when you mentioned Hamilton and then you said Martin Luther and, and how he like like he doesn't care because it's right, and I think that's an interesting um, look at things. And you've said it before, I know it's from Ben Shapiro, but facts don't care about your feelings. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the thing that separates Hamilton from Washington is Washington had this temperance about him, and he had this concern for others that Hamilton didn't. And that's probably why Hamilton was never going to become president, 
Yeah. It's because you can you can stand on a mountaintop and talk about how right you are all the time, but you're not going to win a majority of votes doing that. Um, and I think that, you know, and especially as he was rising up through the ranks, he upset a lot of people, um, regardless how if he was right or not on the issue of the day. He made people angry, and it doesn't care if you're right. If they don't like you, they're not going to pick you to be the guy in charge. Yeah. Um, whereas Washington was able to use him as aide de camp as a tool for his cabinet and for his agenda. Um, but he was also able to use Jefferson in that, and he's also able to use John Adams in that. Um, he was able to take those conflicting viewpoints and backgrounds, and and. Uh, factions and bring them together under his administration you know one thing that i had forgotten up until watching this musical and reading the book was that the first the first few um must have been the first three terms of the american presidency was the winner was president the runner-up was vice president and i want to throw it out there maybe something we tried this year (laughs) <laughs> just, you know, uh, yeah. just anyone, maybe you want to. That would be awesome. God, that, that would be so entertaining. <laughs> it, it doesn't even matter who gets president and who's vice president. I just, that'd be amazing. I, it would make me, it'd make my heart so happy to see that happen. Yeah. But obviously we, we knew what was happening in those first well, I guess the third term was the worst with John Adams, with Thomas Jefferson as the uh, vice president. Um, yeah. But. And then Burr was the vice president, but I think after Burr's, Jefferson's first term with Burr as vice president, then they changed the, the, the statute. Yeah, I didn't understand that either because at one point, he was referred to as Mr. Vice President. Yeah, but he was Thomas Jefferson. I, I didn't president. read anything about him being Vice President. Was he? He yeah he was. That he, he was. But then okay. after his, but after that term, I think is when the law changed, and then they said, yeah, no more second place gets to be VP. Well, and I think um, because at that point they started, since the political parties had formed, the Federalists and the Republicans, and not mm-hmm. the Republicans now. They don't trace their roots to this. this is what Democrats trace their roots to. Um, they they started to have tickets with two names on them so that you had and again i'm not sure if it was a, an amendment well, or because how it was it was just the way the parties set it up because up until then yeah. there weren't parties officially and so it was just yeah, technically a, washington was of no party john right. adams was a federalist and jefferson was a democratic republican and that's by that point, that's when the two party system had come to be. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's just interesting how, I mean, that's an interesting look is just how much it's changed from the way the founders set it up to how it functions today as far as the vice presidency. Yeah. Still, Which was an interesting still a pointless dig that. job. Just who gets it? Is well, different. that's the thing is, it, Jefferson said. Because there's a throwaway line in there about how John Adams, oh, John Adams visits his family in the summer. And I, I don't know if it was Jefferson that said it or Hamilton that said it because, yeah, but he doesn't have a real job. And at that point, yeah. John Adams was the <laughs> vice president. It's like, yeah. Like, well, that's a dig. But So um, I want to ask this question. What's your ahead. favorite number in the film, in the musical? And it's tricky um, for me because I could have five that I could listen to over and over. I I don't. Somebody's gonna have to go ahead of me because <laughs> I, I I like the scene when they first meet in the bar and you know tomorrow morning there's gonna be twenty more of us or whatever the the number was. Um, they knew that something something big was happening and that just gets you hyped up for the revolution. Did you, did you get hyped up for the revolution, Cameron? Are you ready to go? Totally you ready to roll? Did. You got your musket? Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> the red coats are coming. <laughs> so, you know, I think there's a handful of numbers. I really liked Wait For It. It kind of spoke to me uh, on a kind of a personal level. But <clears throat> if there's a number that's just enjoyable, um, it's uh, You'll Be Back. 
uh, with King. Oh, George. with King George. That, that was, was hilarious. One. And <laughs> so, you know, I've been kind of like doing some research. You know, I did the reading. I, I did some research on the musical itself. And, you know, Lin-Manuel Miranda had done a musical before. He started writing this in like 2008, the first few songs. Um, did either of you ever watch House? Uh, first couple seasons. So it's with Hugh Laurie, who's English. And Lin-Manuel Miranda is in an episode of House. And I think they're like in a mental institution. And I guess while they were talking on set, Lin-Manuel Miranda said something about the revolution. And Hugh Laurie said to him, yeah, but you'll be back. And that was kind of like, I guess, the seed for that song. Mm-hmm. Um, and otherwise, you know, it's, I think it's just a hilarious song. And I think uh, Jonathan Groff, who you might remember from Kristoff and Sven, or no, Kristoff, yeah, Kristoff and Sven from Frozen and Frozen 2, the sequel. Um, he just nailed that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, King George is one of my, his three little scenes are probably my favorite scenes. I Just love his reference to John Adams too. Little, yeah, the short one. little John Adams, yeah, the short one. And he's and it's so funny. He's like he's like, what comes next? Do you feel free? Do you know how to lead? You're on your own now. Awesome! Wow! Like, good job. You won your war. <laughs> Have fun trying to form a new country. Um, which I thought was interesting. I, I guess my favorite number. And I'm gonna be honest, I I enjoyed this musical, but it's not something I'm raving over like the rest of America is. Like it was good, but I think forever and for always Lame Is is gonna be my all time favorite musical. And so this fell short of that, so it's not well, they, they, that great. They had Lame Is in there. Thomas Jefferson talks about it a couple times. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Because just... Lame Is was written in the eighteen fifties. No, I just like the, the revolution, right? Just the French in general. French Revolution. Yeah. Just a mess. Um Isn't that what Le, I, Le Miserable is? The mess? Yeah, but it's like yeah, that's what it is, the mess. <laughs> yep. You love uh going after our so you'd definitely be on Hamilton's side about letting the French to their oh, own yeah. affairs when they went after the English, even though oh, they yeah. saved us. Oh yeah. Well, which is another point is that Jefferson made in that in that debate he had with Hamilton in the musical is that you have no understanding of loyalty. They are the reason we have our independence and we're not going to support them now. And Hamilton goes, yeah, well, their king is dead. So who's going to, if the king was still alive, maybe we could honor that agreement. And it's like, it's like, well, yeah. Who are you talking to in France? Yeah. Who's in charge? Um, and, and, you know, there's some things about, I want to say, as I look philosophically at, at Jefferson and Hamilton, I find myself struggling because philosophically, I think I fall into Jefferson's camp on almost every issue. But mm-hmm. I'm also struggling with all that freedom. If if Hamilton doesn't get what he's working towards, that freedom goes away in a mob. Like the mob just takes over. And what Hamilton is advocating for is for there to be some strength with the government so that the freedom can be secured. And that's a, man, that's a, that's a wrestling match between those two. So Mm -hmm. I find myself really kind of leaning towards Hamilton in that what, what's necessary here is strength Because without it, the freedom is only going to last until the next mob takes over. And and mm-hmm. democracy has its merits, but there's nothing as good as a strong republic. Because a, a democracy, you need 50 plus 1%, and you can have your way. And that's a problem. That That's a danger, right? So I kind of struggled with that. Yeah, but it but it goes back to that dichotomy again. Is the dichotomy of 
the guy um, who was, you know, all over the place. But it, it's it's cool to see that that's the beauty of, of being able to debate and figure these out and things out as a country is, you know, it's easy to sit and, you know, I was reading the Wikipedia article ahead of the, the movie, and it's so easy to play armchair quarterback now and say, oh, well, you know, government overreach and all of that. But no, during that time, a fledgling country that really didn't have any money, you, he did what he had to do really to centralize things so we can... Mm-hmm. Can you imagine you know, what Dave Ramsey would have said in the revolution? I know, I know. Like the, the idea of, this. of basically what Hamilton is, is vying for is like, we need a good credit score. That's what we need. Exactly. And the only way to do that is to take out a credit card. And, yes. and we need a credit card in order to build credit. Yes. And Dave Ramsey being like, no, no, just save your money. <laughs> and That's that, exactly what I was it's, thinking. <laughs> it's, oh, I wonder, if, I wonder if Dave Ramsey watched Hamilton. Or sorry, Blave Blamsey. And he was just like, no, just <laughs> screaming at the TV. Save your money. Don't use a credit yeah. card, America. But, yeah. but that's the thing is, and this was, I guess, a criticism I had of this musical is because they spanned his entire life in t- less than three hours. You really didn't get to see what made Hamilton a lion in the early American Republic. I mean, yeah, they talked about him forming the National Bank, assuming the state's debts, so that they could be able to build a credit system. But they mentioned it literally in in one of those battles between him and Jefferson. And then that was it. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I think that's the thing that bothered me about this is like, I wish they would have just picked one period of his life to really hone in on because everything just happened so fast yeah like he was in the caribbean then he was in new york then he was in the the revolutionary war now he's an attorney now he's in washington's cabinet up now he's out of washington's cabinet up now he's dead like everything happened so fast that you just kind of like you couldn't really sink into any one specific thing there was no single theme um that kind of drove the story except for like you said there was the theme of not throwing away your shot. Who's going to tell your story? And and I guess, yeah, I, I think one criticism I saw on on Facebook um, was basically that, you know, Hamilton was fine, but it was just basically just a bunch of dis- different kind of disjointed historical events thrown in there. And and I'd agree, yeah, that that's kind of true. But if we want to. You know, if the goal is let's tell as much about Hamilton as we can, let's try to paint a picture of his life um, from beginning to end and see that arc, it's going to take us three hours and we're going to be jumping from puddle to puddle, um, getting just a little bit of splash of everything. Um, yeah, I mean, part of me, <clears throat> you know, I, I was kind of thinking about this musical and uh, I guess there was some talk about doing this like they wanted to bring it to the big screen, right? Like they wanted to turn it into a cinematic musical, which would have a totally different look and feel, right, than a stage musical. Mm-hmm. And I heard that and I thought, well, that, that'd be interesting. You know what would be really interesting? I know HBO did the John Adams miniseries. It'd be really interesting to do like a two or three season series kind of from the end of the, or maybe during the French and Indian War, starting with Benjamin Franklin and George Washington and youth, and just follow all these founding fathers from their early lives through the Revolution, through you know the Articles of Confederation and the Constitutional uh, uh, Convention to the early Republic, right to their deathbeds, right? Like James Madison, Monroe, Franklin, Adams, Jefferson, Hamilton, Washington, Burr, and just, you know, kind of that epic, sweeping Game of Thrones level story over the course of 40 years um, and do it, you know, do it as, as realistically as, as possible and put that into a, a big miniseries. I, that would be, again, it would take that, right, to get all those stories down. Um, 
I'd be interested in doing that or seeing that. Sorry. I guess you and I could write it, Jake. You want to do that? <laughs> sure. Yeah, let's add we'll, it to we'll the talk list. To Nick about writing our mini series. That should be ready in what six, seven weeks or so. Okay. So here's the thing, though. Uh, there was a yeah. mini series. Uh, was it called Sparta? Yeah, there is. I think it was more than a mini series, but you know that that was written by like a high school teacher. He wrote the first couple scripts and sent it off, and they picked it up, and they're like, "All right, no, you're the showrunner." And so we had to learn how to be the showrunner for that. So I'm just okay. Just saying, we could do that. I'll, sh- yeah, I'll share the script with you in Google Docs, and we can go from there. Let's do it. <laughs> Sweet. Um, and it, and another thing, I guess I saw. Oh, first of all, I didn't get back to it. The song I liked, I guess, the most was Washington's Farewell Address. Um, that was probably that was, the, that the was best. A banger. Yeah, maybe because it was Washington's Farewell Address. Probably is why I liked it so much. Set to music, but um. Uh, the Christopher Jackson played him. I thought he just did a great job. Like, there's not really anyone to follow you know what in I, that cast, but it, it's funny because uh, Christopher Jackson plays Chunk on Bull, which is a CBS like courtroom drama show. Uh-huh. And so when we were, who's like he's like an illegal consultant for the main character, and I'm he pops up as George Washington, and me and my wife go, "That's Chunk." <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, never mind. It's George Washington. He really Sorry, doesn't sir. like being called like, that. He likes being called no. sir or the general. The general. Um, but yeah, that was a really good one for me. And it, another thread I saw was um, with Aaron Burr and Hamilton. Their whole relationship, the way it's depicted in the musical, it's like they're friends, and then it sours when Burr becomes takes uh, Hamilton's father-in-law's Senate seat, switches parties, and then the final straw is when Hamilton comes out to declare for Jefferson in the election. And I was like, yeah, but I don't think Hamilton like begrudgingly took that position. He took it, like he actively campaigned against Burr. It wasn't like, yeah, I guess I'll pick Jefferson. He's the lesser of two evils. He's like, no, Jefferson is the guy. Do not vote for Burr. Burr is terrible. And so... I think they kind of softened that that schism between the two in in the musical, where in reality it was far more stark. Yeah, so I, you know Hamilton. One of the things that Hamilton, his opinion of Burr was that Burr was um, the kind of person who was an opportunist. And he says it early on. You know, if if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything, which is um, you know kind of true because Burr. Um, had had certain kind of things he stood on, but then just he was just a, a good talker. He was able to kind of kind of push himself into situations to get power. Um, he was more interested in being in office than for fighting for something, right? So he, he had no principles. And that mm-hmm. was kind of, you know, in the musical at least, Jefferson actually stands for something even if i disagree with it um i'd rather go with that than somebody who you know we don't know what he stands for other than himself yeah yeah it must have been the first politician documented in american history you know well, by today's standards. So I've been, you know, I, I really enjoyed reading the, the biography. So I picked up um, Ron Chernow's other book, um, Washington, A Life, which is a little bit longer. Um, and I'm in the early parts of that book. And even pre-revolution in like the Virginia House of Burgesses, uh, even early on, like during the early Republic, it was like uncouth to uh, like... Like I don't know what you'd call it, like electioneering, like running for office, campaigning for office. Which is something that they mentioned in the musical is, oh, you're actively campaigning? Hamilton asked that of Burke because he's like yeah. going door to door. And, but and see, even that. Washington, 
when he ran for the House of Burgesses, you kind of kept yourself aloof. You're like, oh, you know, I'll serve if you want me to, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not really interested. Um, while he didn't actively campaign, he was paying, like, certain people to do things. He was paying, like, the sheriff to uh, call some certain names first who would cast mm-hmm. their ballots, and they did it publicly. Like, I am voting for George Washington. Um, and see if he could get, like, the first 14 ballots uh, friendly names so that they would vote for him, which once you know where it's kind of going in the first 14 votes, again, why I think the primaries all need to be on one day. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, George Washington, while he didn't campaign, you had other people campaign for you. Mm-hmm. And you that's where you, your active participation was. And so, you know, I, we kind of look back on those days and think, you know, look how civilized they were and then you see some of the things that they actually did and wrote about each other um it really wasn't more civilized i just wish we had twitter back then at least for these founding fathers that would be a hoot right Mm -hmm. i mean i know calvin coolidge's twitter would have been like i'm now president of the united states and then four years later i'm no longer president of the united states and those are his two (laughs) tweets right he might talk about a nice sandwich he had or something, but maybe yeah, otherwise it was yummy. Right. So, yeah, I do think you're, and that's a good point is, and this is something we've kind of alluded to in the past. Um, when we talked about Lincoln, but especially these founding fathers, I think the image of them is, is, is they're kind of monolithic. They're all this, just one group and they were all brothers in arms and they, beat the British and fought for freedom and they fought, you know, to build this new nation, which are all largely true statements. But within that one group, there's so many fractions. Um, The divisions between the North and the South are already there. Um, The divisions between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists or their Democratic Republicans as they came to be known were already there and and the idea do we have a strong central government or do we keep it decentralized do the states mind their own affairs all these are things that were happening in real time as they were dealing with it um you know jefferson jefferson was the secretary of state under washington then he was the vice president under adams and then he ran against adams to become the president you know like there's a lot of antagonism between these founding fathers that kind of gets glossed over um, because all we see now is this this just kind of idealized picture of them that has been passed on to us that we just don't get into the nitty gritty. So it was kind of cool to see that those debates and those fights between them coming out in this musical. I think that's one thing I really appreciated. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to see, again, kind of the humanness of these people come through. We kind of know the, these these litanies, litanies of failures, moral failings of these different founding fathers. You know, George Washington owned slaves. Early on, he had a temper, um, which he later came to control. Thomas Jefferson owned slaves, um, but people also called him kind of a man of the people. John Adams, kind of an abolitionist, anti-slavery, but also like a a curmudgeon, right? Um, Mm -hmm. Alexander Hamilton, not necessarily like a strong abolitionist, especially, you know, he he never really gets to get into that stuff. And I think we talked about that um, a couple episodes ago, Jake. You mentioned... uh, someone who is fighting for, I don't know if it was like women's suffrage. Susan B. Anthony. Susan B. Anthony. And she fought for women's suffrage. And they said, what about, you know, uh, you know, other civil rights? And it's like, well, this is what I'm focusing on. And Hamilton, who was anti-slavery and even was part of the manumission society, which was trying to like buy and free slaves, um, never really actively in his position of power, worked against slavery. It's like, was that a failing, or was he just focused on something else at the time? 
was he focused on making sure we were a solvent nation, right? Um, Mm -hmm. But his moral failing had to do with him putting work in front of family and putting family kind of into a a tertiary or, or fourth position after, you know, his own physical desires, right? So, you know, he has his own moral failings. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, from from what it sounds like as well, he was not he was not a deist either. Um, he was fairly, you know, Thomas Jefferson, I think uh, John Adams to some extent had kind of taken on. I think they called John Thomas Jefferson an atheist constantly. Like after his time in France, they're like, well, you're one of those atheists along with all the French, right? Like that was kind mm-hmm. of their their jab at him but hamilton was uh from all evidence a christian like actual you know the creeds are true christian um Mm -hmm. which is kind of an interesting you know especially during that time the age of enlightenment that doesn't seem to be i don't know if en vogue is in the is the word but that doesn't seem to be where people really are especially in these heights of power. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. I mean, there's a lot of deism going around with the founding fathers. Um, and there are exceptions to that, Hamilton being one. I think John Adams, I thought he was not a deist, but um, Jefferson yeah, I, certainly I, I was. And Benjamin way. Franklin was... If he was a Christian man, he was lapsed. Um, but, you know, there's that, that idea that uh, they all generally believed in a higher power, but it, it what that entailed um, varied greatly between them. They were not a bunch of Puritans, so to speak, as we would think of them. Um, which is just another example of showing their differences between mm-hmm. between them all. Um, which is, I think, is a good thing to see that they weren't all just like this one homogenized group of people. They all had different goals and different passions and different um, beliefs. And okay, while so they largely agreed on things, they varied greatly across political and social and and um, religious spectrums. So that, that leads me to another question. <clears throat> It's kind of a loaded one. Well, I don't know if it's loaded, but it, it's a it's kind of a pointed question, um, because I know this has kind of been going around, especially in the past few weeks, um, kind of in general among art and film. The choice um, in Hamilton to have a cast that, I guess, racially didn't reflect the people who were the characters. What are your mm-hmm. thoughts on that? And I and I I do have my own thoughts. I'm not trying to like trigger anybody, but you know, that's an intentional piece of this musical that the cast was not all white even though all the characters were white. Um I'm just curious as to your thoughts. As I was watching it that popped into my mind, but I didn't really give it much thought past that. I mean, I I don't think it would have added or detracted to the story changing the the races of of, of any of the characters. Um, Yeah, it was a non-issue as far as I was concerned. Um, I would agree. I I really didn't care, I guess. Um, I think in general taking American history or any history and in a sense making it your own and the majority of this cast I'm assuming is grown up in America I think taking it and making it their own is awesome and the only comparison I could think of off the top of my head and it may seem silly is when heist or when schools do like Thanksgiving Day plays or stuff like that and you have this cast of kids and you know those kids are all playing 
especially now with as diverse as so many schools are those kids are playing characters that they're not the race of Mm -hmm. but that's not the point they're telling a story about the country's past and that's the point whether or not they're playing the quote-unquote right character um is secondary so I, i think that's kind of my take on this is they're telling a story about america's past the the color of the actor's skin is less important to me than the story being told yeah so there there's a couple um there's a couple things on youtube i found first was a a channel flicks in the city mm-hmm. um and it had a, a few episodes about hamilton and one of them the uh the quote and this might actually be from another, they pulled it from another series. I think like Hamilton's America, which is on PBS, um, which is a documentary about the musical. But the quote is, it's a story about America then told by America now. Mm-hmm. And, and that's kind of, I guess, that sums up what I was thinking when I watched it. Because I know there's some people that kind of, they this that detracted them from the film. They didn't like it or or they, I don't know, they went off on some tangent about it. I think when when I realized, first of all, that it's an intentional, the cast is going to be diverse. Um, if I think about New York City in 1776, when Alexander Hamilton is there, that city was possibly one of the most diverse cities in the world in that it had English, Dutch, French, German, Irish, Scottish, among probably the many slaves that were there from Africa, like that city was not, that was not English London at the time or French Paris or German Berlin or Italian Rome, right? New York City in the late 1700s was a very diverse city. And so Mm -hmm. as diverse as it was then, fast forward to now, the, the, the gaps in some of those differences then are, are kind of what we see in, in all these groups now in, in the United States. And I just thought it was a, a, an interesting thing to see. First of all, the story is primary and the ideas that these people, both the founding fathers uh, and in, in this case, the Schuyler sisters, these women, especially Eliza, who is Hamilton's wife, um, their stories take the primary they're out in front and it's not it's not that it's racially set up to look exactly like it did in the late 1700s um so i think it's a good it's a good commentary on where we are right the ideas are what have come down that's the legacy Mm -hmm. that's the ancestry we have is to the ideas not to a certain set of dna yeah well, and, and I think great stories lend themselves to that is you shouldn't, you, you don't get lost in necessarily does this person look right for the part, but that they, they're telling a great story and they're doing a great job at it. I mean, that's what makes Shakespeare timeless. Mm-hmm. You don't have to look like 16th century Englishmen anymore to perform Shakespeare. And I think that's the beauty of why Shakespeare is timeless is because it transcends. And in this case, with this story, um, Hamilton transcends 18th century America to 21st century America. And I think that's a really cool thing Mm -hmm. is that the story itself, I mean, it's a story that you could be told today by people in America today. Like it's not wholly unique there's people like hamilton today that put all things beyond put all things behind success or your legacy and and even a family they'll put them in second you know that's not a a new story or you know oh, as we and, said, and neither is nothing coming, is new under the sun yeah there's nothing um, new about coming from nothing and yeah. being an immigrant and the fight for freedom and equality you know, what did they say immigrants get things done yeah um, and, and that know. was a clever line and i guess that all that always gets a good cheer from the crowd and And it's like, you know what, that there's something true there, right? Because immigrants Mm -hmm. coming to this country generally don't take anything for granted. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as far as 
those of us that, that kind of know our own an- ancestry back to who came over, we, you know, I know that at least one part of my family came, coming from Ireland during the potato famine uh, came over and got off the boat and like, look for work. Like, mm-hmm. let's, let's go do something. Um, but Hamilton is not just that. It's to the highest, nearly the highest office. He was in that room for eight years um, with the very yeah. first president of the United States, touching and kind of not manipulating, but affecting policy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very true. So I liked it. Obviously, it's gotten me into um, some biographies, kind of gotten me into a little bit of a colonial revolutionary. It opened that door again for me to do some reading there. And, and I've got a handful of books that I'm kind of working through with those those people in that time because it's very interesting to me. Now, this kind of, like I said, I, th- these were not on my list and uh, a month ago, and now they are. It's where I'm at. Yeah, it's a different different perspective for sure. You know, on a different you know, a, a time in history that we're all very familiar with from a slightly different angle. You can always learn more about something. That you yeah, absolutely. And I, yeah, I mean, it, like I said, it, it, I enjoyed it. I mean, and I guess I could nitpick at it, but I, I liked it, and I, I think the stories that were told in that were very good stories, and I, I really was drawn towards the Skylar sisters and, um, and that whole relationship there. I think that was fascinating to me, and and learning more about them was awesome. I, I think the, the Jefferson Hamilton debates was very entertaining to see that back and forth. Um, so yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I, I think. Um, the thing I liked most is that it showed those details that we often gloss over when we read about our history um, that had so much context and so much depth and uh, that's what made it really I think a good um, such a good movie or, or musical however you want to phrase it does that wrap up this yeah, episode so. of Dad Bought at the Movies? Dad Bod goes to the movies. Yeah, that's a, the right. second one we've done. Um, mm-hmm. They've got a handful of movies I'd like to do again, but we just got to make sure you all have access to them and don't have to log into my accounts for everything. So, Yeah, I'm not going to pay the big mouse. <laughs> the big to, mouse. I'm not going to pay that guy. Don't, don't say his name because then we have Another to pay monthly them. surcharge. You know who I'm talking about. <laughs> Chucky, please. That's who I'm talking about. Actually, I think they went bankrupt. Um, oh, well, then they'll definitely come never mind. after us. Yeah. So, anyway, yeah, that was a good, good one. We'll have to pick another movie to to review. Yep, Wonder I've Woman. Got, I've got Wonder Woman 1984 mind. got delayed, so we'll have to push that. But it's 1985 now, so yeah, they're gonna have to. Rename. Is that coming out soon? It got like pushed a, to Christmas. Oh, cool. Yeah. Awesome. So it was supposed to be. I think it's gotten delayed like three times, four times now because of this pandemic. But I think it's Christmas yeah. now. Black Black Widow was supposed to be in May, and I think that's pushed back to November. I don't know. But now, like Tenet by Christopher Nolan, he's just like, nope, open it where it can open. Yeah. See, he's he's kind of a Hamilton guy, right? He's just like, I don't care. Just put my movie out there. If you want to see it, yeah. you'll see it. I, I respect it. I respect his, I guess, cinematic integrity, but I haven't seen the movie, so I guess I don't respect it that much. Not enough to actually pay to go are, see are it. Are theaters open there? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't even considered looking. Hmm. So, All right. Well, thank you for joining us again for Dad Bod History. Dad Bod goes to the movies. I'm Eric. I'm Jake. I'm Cameron. And we will... Uh, See you again some other time. Have a good one, guys.